actually introduce you to my staff. Uh, before I forget, my name is uh, Kevin Ong. I am a professor and the associate department head overseeing extension programs in the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology at Texas A&M. Uh, this is a part of our extension plant pathology and microbiology uh, uh, outreach uh, program. Uh, I would like to ask you guys if you could do something for me is if you would be able to uh, just type in the county that you're from in the chat uh, and and also keep in mind that the chat is where we'll probably uh, uh, take any questions if you have them. And uh, and I realize not everybody is a master gardener and uh, there's several of you that are here uh, or at least I noticed registered are actually first detectors uh, that have been through the uh, crucible, as uh, we call it. And you'll learn a little bit more about that program today. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I have 10.03 right now. I believe we have about two hours. Um, let me tell you what today is going to be and what it's not. Uh, today is meant to be an introduction to the first detector program, uh, specifically uh, what we're trying to do or have been doing here in, in the state of Texas. Uh, and to give you a little background of what the uh, first detector program is, it is a national program, just to give you a little teaser there. Uh, secondly, the, uh, you're not going to become a diagnostician at the end of this. Uh, the goal here is to give you just a little sampling uh, of some of the things that might be covered in a first detector training uh, and highlight a few of those things that are of uh, current concern right now in the state of Texas. Uh, before we move any further, let me go ahead and introduce uh, my staff. Um, first of all, uh, let me um, introduce you to Dr. Pedro Uribe. Uh, Pedro uh, joined my staff on technical science group uh, last year, and he's responsible for some of the uh, um, uh, survey work as well as monitoring uh, um, for uh, pests and pathogens of concern. Pedro will be conducting most of this training, especially when talking a little bit about uh, uh, different things to be aware of, recognition, and some diagnostics. And I also want to, yeah, go ahead, Pedro. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Just to say hi. Okay. Um, then I also have to introduce to you uh, Amanda Vitaco, uh, our uh, uh, project specialist. Uh, she's actually the one who who did a lot of the grunt work to get this uh, program put together, uh, uh, visit with the right people to make sure the links are all working and so on. So Amanda, would you just introduce yourself? Good morning, guys. My name is Amanda. I'm the program specialist. Um, if you guys have been receiving emails, they've probably been from me. Um, thank you guys all for being here this morning. And um, I hope this will be a great experience for everyone. All right, thank you, Amanda. Um, so I was going to say, let's get started because, uh, uh, we don't have a lot of time and there's a lot of folks, uh, I guess I still going to just drop in. Uh, so hopefully, um, again, please take note, this session will be recorded, um, or is being recorded right now. So let's go ahead. And, and what I want to do initially is to kind of share with you a little bit of background and history of the first detector program. Um, how it was developed and then um, uh, what it's a part of and how we are or what we're doing here in Texas. So, uh, Pedro, do you have the slide sets on? Okay, I think most of you should be able to see the slides on your screen. And so go ahead to the first slide. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things is... Uh, when we put together a, a training session like this, or even an introductory session like this, I'd like to point out a few things that, that we want to try and accomplish here. So hopefully uh, uh, at, at the end of this couple of hours, you should be able to uh, recognize some, some damage patterns and so on, and, and, and be able to uh, uh, differentiate at least in general, some of those uh, uh, causal factors uh, that, that cause uh, plant damage or plant health issues. Um, and then the thing that we, we talk about is explain what questions are considered when diagnosing plant problems. This is no different when you're dealing with any, any form of medicine, whether it's human health, animal health, or in this case, plant health, is, is knowing the right questions to ask 
and, and to be able to get to an answer. So we're going to try and explore a little bit of that. And just to give you a, a, a teaser or a sampling about uh, um, some of the things that would be done in greater detail at a first detector training program. Uh, the other thing we do want to highlight is uh, uh, that we do have a, a, well, we have several plant clinics in the state of Texas. Uh, the main hub is the Texas Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab, which I'm also the director of, uh, based in College Station. And our mission is to basically be able to respond to any plant health issue uh, with, with help with diagnosing the problem and, and be able to do that for all crops as well. So uh, it is sort of a, um, a place where, where samples can be sent in if there's concern, if there's a question, uh, or if there's a need for that type of service. So uh, the one thing that we hopefully will go over in the last 15, 20 minutes or so, or Pedro will go over this, is, is knowing what type of sample or what sample to submit. Because keep in mind, the, the quality of the diagnosis is as good as the quality of the sample. So if it's a bad sample, there's a very good chance that you're not going to get a very good diagnosis. So keep that in mind as part of it is, is you know, science and part of it is going to be art as well. <clears throat> um, so let's move on to the next slide, please. <coughs> All right. So um, the first detector program is actually a national program and it's part of the national plant diagnostic network and 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 so to kind of point out a few things um what is the national plant diagnostic network or npdn as we like to 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 call it and on this slide you'll pro uh, you'll see a, a a map of our country and and five different regions and i'll go more into that so Pedro, if you would change to the next slide, please. So the National Plant Diagnostic Network is a network that was kind of developed and created in 2002 uh, by, at that time, what is called the USDA CSRES, or the, uh, um, basically that was a research and extension um, uh, a wing of the uh, USDA, which has now since changed name and now is, uh, uh, they have moved this program under the National Institutes for Food and Agriculture. Now, keep in mind um, that this all started because of the terrorist attack in 9-11. Uh, and after that, basically, we had folks asking, uh, well, when I say folks, folks in Congress asking, well, um, you know, how else can the terrorists attack us in the United States? And so the question came up, if, it were, if they were using a human pathogen, who monitors that? Well, guess what? We have the CDC for that. And then the question, what about animal diseases and plant diseases for that matter, or, or plant pests? Uh, and, the, and, the, and nobody could answer that question because there was no such entities at that time. And so in response for that, um, biosecurity or what we call agricultural biosecurity, um, Congress set aside money. And in 2002, um, there were several uh, networks that were developed, uh, namely the one is uh, uh, Nas the National Plant Diagnostic Network. But there was also a network for the animal health. The, uh, that's the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. And part of the emergency uh, disaster network was also uh, born out of those funds that came out of, uh, uh, I guess you could say, a response to how America would react to potential terroristic attack. Now, the goal of the NPDN is to uh, uh, try and be able to quickly um, diagnose and quickly provide information um, to the general public to the people to prevent a potential incursion of whether it's by natural means or by nefarious means of uh, invasive, what we call invasive pests and pathogens. And we do this through early detection and diagnosis. And, and, and so when NPDN was put together, there was... Um, the, the goal was, hey, can we get all our, our plant diagnostic clinics to communicate with one another, 
to 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 be able to um, uh, share information uh, to some degree. Well, in in many states there are diagnostic clinics. For example, in in Texas we have the Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab that has been around since 1957, or the uh, Florida Lab that has been around since the 1920s. And but then there are some states that don't have a lab, and a lot of times these labs are going to be either associated with a land-grant university or the State Department of Agriculture. So in 2002, with that money that was uh, uh, provided, it was like, well, if, if the state has a lab, well, let's get them into a network that they could communicate. And for um, basically states that do not have labs, money was uh, provided to help them set up those type of uh, uh, clinics. Now, the part of the big picture with the National Plant Diagnostic Network is also providing training, not only to diagnosticians, but part of it is how do we get information out to people uh, so that they can recognize if something is not supposed to be here is seen. And, and, and so that partially what came out of that was the first detector program, which is uh, meant to uh, reach out to the general public. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, when you administer a large network like this, it is much easier to split it into uh, what we call manageable units. So for the National Plant Diagnostic Network, there are five different regions that were set up. Um, and what you might notice in this slide, this was the original um, <clears throat> breakdown of of what states and, and, and where they are kind of reporting to. So there's a hub lab for SPDN, which is the uh, Southern Plant Diagnostic Network, that's Florida. GPDN, or Great Plains Diagnostic Network, the uh, hub there is Kansas and, 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 and other places. So I think a lot of you would probably be drawn to the map of Texas and notice that it was split in two. Well, there was a reason for that. So in 2002, when this money came about and uh, the feds were trying to figure out how to provide dollars, um, well, money came to Texas A&M uh, and m and an extension to, to network our clinic that was here. Uh, but there was also some money sent up to uh, the northern part of the state uh, for them to set up a clinic up there uh, at another institution. However, um, what happened was the realization was that money was not really that great. And so it got bounced around and it ended up back in, you could say, uh, A&M AgriLife Extension's lab. And so we do have a lab up in Amarillo, actually, that is, is uh, directed by uh, Dr. Ken Obasa, one of my faculty members. Uh, and, and the task that was given to that specific lab up there is for small grains and row crops. So go ahead and hit, if you can hit next on that. Now, a couple of years ago, due to multiple years of budget cuts and so on, the National Plant Diagnostic Network decided, hey, you know what? We're just gonna have one contract per state. And, and what that amount to for us in Texas was, uh, we basically had our budgets cut by half. And, and, and so now we're operating and have the budget that we used to get before. We do have one lab that's, uh, uh, that you can see as a star in College Station. Go ahead and tap, tap <coughs> again. But we do have two additional clinics. Now, I did tell you about the one in Amarillo uh, that was started in 2004. Uh, that's uh, the green dot. Uh, and we actually have a third clinic down in Westlaco, which is the Texas Plant Virus Diagnostic Lab, uh, which is run by Dr. Uh, uh, Olufemi Alabi, where all they do there is specific uh, molecular work dealing with identification of exotic uh, uh, viruses. So the reason for having this multiple labs is to kind of spread the work, work around. Texas is a huge state. We do, it's an agricultural state. We see a lot of different things, uh, and, and we like to have a couple of labs that perhaps specialize in a few things so we can actually meet the needs of our, 
uh, stakeholders, uh, folks in Texas, um, uh, in a in a more rapid fashion than not. So, um, Pedro, can you go ahead to the next slide? Um, <clears throat> so, one of the things about the this slides that you're looking at, this uh, NPDN provided slides for uh, first detective training, kind of to highlight some of the things that NPDN does. And I think I mentioned uh, some of this to you already. Uh, the I guess there are a few things that are really important today. And one of those is that second thing, which is secure communication system or what they call uh, information security. Um, the, the issue with some of those things is because things that come through the clinic sometimes uh, uh, should not be put out there. And, and, and not only that is we don't want to create undue panic if we don't have to. But at the same time, we want to get the information out there so that people can be aware about what's going on. Now, the good part about dealing with plant health issues or, or, or plant pathogens and pests is a lot of the times, these things, these microorganisms, these insects, they do not really impact human health directly. So, you know, in, in, in one sense, it's, it's not like a situation where you might get a, a, a severe case of a emergency uh, management dealing with something like COVID. But nonetheless, uh, there are certain pathogens that, and, and pests that can cause a lot of damage, uh, not only to our natural resources, but also to our economy. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and, and just uh, uh, put to the next uh, slide. So the next few slides is kind of to get you guys up to, uh, 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 I guess you could say the propaganda slides is, uh, you know, why do we really need a, a national plant diagnostic network? Um, when they look at, at the, uh, the issues back then, and this issue still is a concern today. So this is almost 20 years later. And, and we still have issues where we talk about crop and rangeland vulnerable, vulnerability. You know, it's, it's easy enough for, let's say, if somebody wants to do something bad uh, and, and get away with it, they could potentially utilize a, a pathogen uh, um, in a field. Or much worse or much more realistic is the fact that we have uh, exotic and 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 uh, pests and pathogens of concern that come in through natural means or through accidental means by people carrying them. Uh, you might remember um, several, what is it, a couple of years ago that we had a rash of uh, unsolicited seed packages being sent uh, from overseas. And the concern of that was that could have been pathogens on the seeds or some of those seeds were in fact uh, um, um, recognized as noxious weed seeds. And if they would have gotten loose, uh, it is possible that they could compete and potentially outcompete and, and cause a lot of economic damage to growers as they are growing crops. Um, we still have to uh, consider uh, natural areas, uh, uh, natural resources. Um, and and keep in mind that the two things at the bottom, atropod or nematode pests and virulent plant diseases, uh, we'll discuss a, a few more about those two things. But um, with the, you know, even through the pandemic, and, it, and, and we still have a lot of travel, uh, global travel, things move very quickly around the world today. And, and, and so I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in this country, in any country for that matter, is how do we keep up things that are not here yet, that we don't want to be here, that could, could potentially come in here and cause damage not only to our natural resources, but to our crops as well. Uh, so those are some of the things that NPDN is concerned about, that NPDN does uh, uh, provide those training, those expertise, those service. So Pedro, can you go on to the next slide? Uh, just a few pictures. Uh, realize that the NPDN National Plant Diagnostic Network is not necessarily just plant diseases, but there's insects. Um, uh, and, and, and some of the stuff is this is just um, showing you that the whole idea there too is we have integration with, with some of the other agencies there. Uh, many of us, I think, work uh, uh, with Homeland uh, Security to some degree. And, and under that, that department, um, uh, we do, um, well, some 
uh, diagnostic clinics around the state with the universities do help provide training uh, uh, for personnel, whether it's TSA, Custom Border Patrol, or the USDA uh, uh, smuggling and interdiction uh, trade uh, uh, teams. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Now, the the one thing that I think um, was in the minds of a lot of folks was, you know, saying that, hey, you bring up the idea of agroterrorism. Is it real? I mean, it, is it a real thing that somebody could potentially use a, a pathogen or an insect or whatever uh, uh, to cause severe amount of damage? Well, this slide is just kind of give you a little history of, of uh, what we call bioweapons or biowarfare. And uh, the most recent uh, was now, I think about what, 30 plus years ago, when the uh, Soviet Union fell, they found labs where they could uh, see that they were trying to produce not only animal pathogens, but also plant pathogens in terms of uh, utilizing those as, as weapons. Now, I do want to point out that the United States is, 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 is not immune to this, and we did have a bioweapons program dealing with crop, uh, <clears throat> crop destruction uh, back in the 60s and, uh, 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 you know, going into the early 70s. And in fact, um, I think now about 12 years ago, I actually got, a, uh, I think, a phone call from somebody who said, hey, you know, I got a couple of bottles here uh, of stuff that says Russ, do you want it? And, and, and I was like, why would I want a couple of tubes of Russ until he told me about his granddad who passed away and he was clearing out the, 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 the I guess, the garage or something and found those two vials. And the, uh, the granddad was one of the, the scientists that worked for USDA in Fort Detrick while they were developing those as a, a, a weapon against the Soviet Union. So this is uh, wheat rust uh, type stuff. And you can actually look, look those things up or, or do an internet search uh, on, 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 on uh, I guess, what did they call that? The feather bomb and, and, and Russ. And, and those were some of the programs that has been declassified, but the U.S. did look at that as a potential uh, bioweapon. Now, I do want to point out on the biology side of things, before you guys start thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we could actually uh, uh, destroy crops and all that. Um, one of the researchers from the U.S., the plant pathologist that did that work on Russ, made a comment one time and he says, you know, it's easy enough to get the pathogen where we want it to go, but it's much harder to convince the pathogen to do its job. So keep in mind that if you're dealing with a biological agent, the biological agent is a, a, a live agent. And, and, and there are a lot of things that must come together that must occur for disease to happen. So as such, it's, it's not just a simple, oh, we have this thing, and if we spread it, we will cause disease. No, it will not. Uh, there are certain requirements, uh, naturally speaking. So, so it is a little bit more complicated uh, uh, than just saying this is something like a chemical that we put in there and, and, and some reaction will happen. It could, but it might take a little bit longer. It might take certain types of conditions to do that. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, now, this one is one that I want to bring up uh, uh, as a concern for you folks. Um, a lot of times, and, and, and I put myself in this category, when you move to a state or a country from a different state or a different country, quite often you bring things. And some of those things you might know that are not allowed, and there are things that you might not know that it's disallowed. And, and so true that we can accidentally bring stuff uh, into somewhere where it does not have uh, uh, that particular pathogen or insect. Uh, if you have been through international port of entries uh, like Houston, you may have noticed the little dogs, those beagles. They're there to do a job to try and find food material or materials um, uh, that could potentially harbor any of this uh, uh, pest and pathogens there. And so you get you might get food confiscated and so on uh, for, if you're coming back from certain countries. And you might also recognize that if you come in from certain countries, you might get checked, but other countries you do not. Now, 
All this stuff is being done in, in a targeted form, realizing that if you are entering from, let's say, Mexico, there are certain things from Mexico that we do not have in the U.S. and we do not want it here. And so those would be the target agents. Um, uh, air cargo is a very quick way to move things around the world. And, and you probably also recognize that in the state of Texas, Houston is is one of the busiest port in the U.S., and, and we do uh, bring a lot of things here. Um, several years ago, there was a report on um, how efficient is the inspection of containers uh, bearing perishable goods. And I think at that time, the report was something like 2 point something percent of all containers were checked. And, and so you might say, wait a minute. So is it even worth it that that Custom Border Patrol is checking this stuff because they're only checking two out of every hundred containers? And the answer to that is yes, it is. Because even though it might just be a 2% uh, 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 materials that were checked, but keep in mind is it's not random. You know, there are going to be things that that is going direct uh, where those inspections occur, where those uh, uh, monitorings uh, should be occurring. So uh, can you go ahead and move on to the next slide, Pedro? So just to kind of cap it up real quick and, 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 and let's move on to the second part is keep in mind, we still need planned biosecurity. Now I'm talking here in the context of international and national, uh, but keep in mind too, this the same principles, the type of thinking that you would do, the type of practices you might do can apply and should apply to your own backyards uh, to, to maintain that, that pristine uh, uh, garden that you want or the type of production that you want in, in, in your uh, backyard garden. Um, you know, at the national level, we do want to maintain a security of food production, meaning that we want to be able to make sure that the United States can produce sufficient food to feed all the people in the United States. And, and, and we do want to um, uh, protect our, not only our crop supply, but also natural resources against invasive pests and diseases. And that's one of the most challenging things that, that we get on an annual basis, usually one or two cases. Uh, and, and sometimes those get into the news. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. So uh, quickly bring it back to the first detectors. The, Going to, to keep in mind, again, the mission of the NPDN is to enhance national agricultural security, limit the impact of endemic and emerging and exotic pathogens and pests in the United States. Well, one of the ways that we can do this or accomplish this is to utilize what we call citizen scientists, folks like you guys out there who says, hey, I'm interested in learning more about this. Why, why does it work? Early detection. If you can find something that looks odd and you said, this is weird, let's have it checked out. And you can have or know places where you can get an accurate diagnosis. Then what happens is you can take action early on. The earlier the action is taken, the much easier it is to contain. Uh, so part of the NPDN too with the labs is they have a network to be able to communicate things uh, a little bit better, I guess, or, or more rapidly. So, so this is what we try to keep in mind with first detectors, or at least we're trying to impart. Knowledge to allow for early detection, knowledge to know where to get an accurate diagnosis, and basically to have those connections so that we can communicate rapidly if there's new information that might be available. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, you know, in some of the trainings, uh, you see this person here looking through a hand lens, probably looking at some insects or so. If we do this, and we have done this in the past where we have first detected training uh, for massive gardeners here in uh, College Station, and, 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 and I think uh, once we did it in, in Belton, uh, we may get into a situation where you might get uh, to experience some hands-on type uh, uh, training and so on. Let's move on to the next slide. So I just want to point out again to, to kind of uh, um, um, recap a few things. Hopefully, when you, you go through today's training and you said, you know, hey, I hear some things that, that are real interesting and I, I would love to be uh, a part of this, this gig 
and, and help out as a first detector. Well, the role of a first detector is to be knowledgeable. You know, we, we look for folks that want to learn, want to keep on learning. Um, and, and, and you don't have to be a master gardener uh, to be a part of the uh, first detector program. There is a, uh, a national uh, online website that actually have fact sheets and so on. Uh, we would love, and, and in Texas, we would love for you to be a part uh, uh, of our registry here in Texas, because that way we know that we can direct uh, certain types of information as needed uh, to specific areas. So there are opportunities for uh, National Plant Diagnostic Network first detector online training or in-person training. So just stay tuned uh, with our AgriLife calendar and so on. Um, a first detector to be alert to unusual or different things related to plant health. Um, there is a national notification registry. I think that's the one that if you get online uh, to the uh, uh, national uh, first detector website, there's some place that you can register uh, yourself to make sure that you get the newsletters and so on. Uh, so that, that's what we call the pest alerts and other updates uh, through the first detector newsletter. Uh, it has, over the past few years, it has slowed down quite a bit due to budget situations, but I think they're bringing it back at the national level. A lot of the things that are happening right now uh, uh, at the local level, at the state level, and, uh, um, and I'm glad to say with Amanda on board, we are trying to refresh some of our uh, fact sheets, some of our material. And uh, the last two years, we've been hampered and unable to do any of the uh, in-person training. So we may be looking to do some of those. Uh, in the near future. So with that, I'm going to quit here and uh, to talk about the NPDN and first detector, and I'm going to turn this time over to Pedro, and hopefully um, you guys will be able to learn something uh, uh, when we go through the uh, some of this, uh, I guess you could say, more sciencey stuff. And if you have any questions, do pop them in the chat. We'll try and get them at the end of, of this session. So uh, Pedro, go ahead and take over. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, as, as Dr. Rong indicated, the idea uh, today is to give a brief overview of diagnosis on how do we distinguish between disease and, uh, and something that was caused by, by the environment. So let's, let's get started. Um, so what are the, some of the definitions that we need to to consider in order to do a diagnosis. So what is uh, plant health? Uh, what, what, is, uh, what is diagnosis? What is plant disease? What is an environmental factor? So, so let's, let's, get, let's get started one second, please. Pedro, you muted yourself. Alrighty, okay. There, yes, I was saying. Yeah, I was having problems with my screen. Definitely. Okay. So, what is diagnosis? Is the art of identifying a disease from signs and symptoms. Is um, is the process of the investigation and the analysis of the cause of, of the of the condition, the situation of the problem. And in our case, uh, usually uh, diagnosis will lead us to a plant disease to identify the, the causing agent of, of a plant disease. And what is a plant disease? It's a, anything that interferes with the normal appearance, function, or value of the plant and renders some fit for its normal use. It reduces the quantity or the quality of the, of the product that you are cropping, for example. Um, and what causes plant diseases, uh, pathogens, uh, pathogens cause plant disease, the fungi, bacteria, parasitic hairy plants, viruses, nematodes, or also it could be caused by an environmental factors uh, that affects the survival, the growth of the plant, uh, nutrient deficiencies, water quality, climate extremes, air pollution, toxic chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, mechanical damage. So how do we differ differentiate between these? It's not, it's not passing, okay. 
Okay. So the first thing that we do is check for signs and symptoms on, of damage in the plant. So what is a sign? Is the actual pathogen, parts or products of a pathogen that you can see in the disease host plant. The symptom is the reaction of the plant to that pathogen or to that factor that is affecting the, the plant. So, so if you see a sign, most likely you might see a, a symptom. If we have the, the other two conditions, which is a conducive environment, as Dr. Ong said um, earlier when talking about bioterrorism, um, well, you can, it's not easy to convince a pathogen to do its own stuff. Well, yeah, you need the environment, you need a susceptible host, and you need a virulent pathogen. You need to have that triangle, all three conditions at the same time in order to have disease. So if you see, the, if you see a pathogen, well, most likely you can see, maybe you can see the symptoms if you have a conducive environment. So checking for signs, signs and symptoms is the first step of doing a diagnosis. What, what goes next? Well, to try to get a history of what's going on in that plant, in the field, in your backyard. Uh, so you need to, to look for and, and take note of anything that is associated with the, pro with the problem say the cultivation practices, the weather history, and we're gonna go over, over this a little bit for the, down the road. Uh, important, really, really important. You need to know the normal appearance of the plant. So you need to know what is the, the plant, uh, what plant are you talking about? So proper plant identification is critical. You need to recognize what a healthy plant looks like or what is supposed to look like or act like at the current time in question. Say if it's early spring, if it's fall, if it's, uh, if, if it's dormant during the winter, etc. And you need to compare with healthy plants of the same genus, species, and cultivar, ideally. Uh, what else do we do? We also review the cultural practices. Uh, we ask ourselves questions, were proper planting techniques, techniques used? Were fertilizers, pesticides applied at the right time and in the right frequency? Do you water frequent? Or do you put too much water, too little water? How do you control all of that? You need to review the environmental conditions. Were there any temperature extremes? Were drought or excess of the rain? What is the soil type and its condition? Here in Texas, we tend to plant a lot of, uh, of our high yielding crops in special rootstocks that have been conditioned and adapted to our conditions, okay? say peaches, oranges. We use rootstocks precisely for a reason. And that's one of those reasons. It's adapted and we know that whatever we graft into, the, into this rootstock is gonna, it's gonna yield really, really well. Uh, you need to host to check the host specificity and and when you see a problem going on in a lot of different hosts, most likely you're having a, a, an abiotic problem going on, something that is not related with a pathogen. Uh, like in this case, in this picture, uh, we see a, like in a burn area. Well, it turns out that it was a lightning strike in a, in a cotton field. <clears throat> we also look for pat patterns. Uh, spots, yellowing, uh, diebacks, wiltings, leaf drop, uh, abnormalities and, and, and plant death can be symptoms of both biotic and, bi and abiotic factors. We need to look for those patterns in host range, signs and symptoms, development, placement and spread. All of those are really, really important uh, because, because it's going to let us have an intuition if it's a biotic or an abiotic problem. So for example, what are patterns in host range? Biotic factors affect a single species of variety and attack plants or plant parts that are around the same age. 
So in this case, in this in the first picture uh, here, we have a biotic problem. Is damping off of cabbage caused by a black rot bacteria? You see how how all this area. I don't know. I hope you, you guys are seeing my 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 marker, my cursor here, are totally healthy, and all this in the middle towards the the, the side of the of the growing growing a tray are wilting and in bad shape. And on the contrary, we have a, a really, really strong drought on the, on the lower picture. And a various factors will affect multiple species and plants across various ages. Um, we also have a, we know that biotic factors will cause plant symptoms in random, irregular distribution pattern with the severity and timing of the symptoms developing unevenly. And this is because the pathogen is going to be attacking the plants at different stages as, 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 it's, as it's moving in the ho from host to host. So not everything is going to be dying at the same time, not everything is going to be showing symptoms at the same time. You can see in this case a all nematode damage in a in a in a field, and uh, on the contrary, you see a lot of very similar damage caused by herbicide that was as um, that end, uh, ended falling on the leaves in the on the row crops on the bottom. Uh, continuing with the patterns in the spread, uh, we have. We know that the biotic factors are infe infectious and will continue to spread to suitable hosts over time. So, so if you don't see that, that your problem is spreading, yeah, most likely there is, a, there is an abiotic factor going on. We have the, to compare, we have this wind damage caused by burn, uh, burning the, of the leaf tips by wind. And um, on, the, on the opposite side, we have phytophthora of light in a squash. So, so here we have more or less like a, like a summary of, of all those slides. Biotic factors, you're gonna find the symptoms scattered across a localized area. You're gonna have the distribution of the symptoms usually random. And, and we need to keep in mind that that randomness might if you have a, there's always exceptions to the rule, no? If you have a point of entry for the pathogen, you might have, you might see the, that your disease is developing from a, one corner of the field and it start progressing, no? But exactly, you have that progression, you see that progression. In the case of, you might be able to see the pathogen and find the signs of the pathogen in the affected plant. If it's an abiotic factor, you're gonna see the symptoms usually on all the plants and plant types in the area, you're gonna see usually uniform, uniformly damaged areas. Uh, you're gonna see that the symptoms, everything appears at once and do not spread. And those symptoms can be non-specific, making it difficult to diagnose a correct. Um, we also need to keep in mind that when we see a symptom in a plant, the plant is going to show us that something is going on. And those symptoms might, might reflect, might be very similar if it's caused by a pathogen or you know, an abiotic factor. We will, we will see an example further down the road. Um, so what kind of pathogens? Uh, let's go a little bit over pathogens. We know fungi, bacteria, all mycetes, nematodes, parasitic plants, and viruses all can cause infection. Um, but we need to keep in mind that like, like in, in humans and in, in animals, the disease, uh, being having a disease in a plant is deception, is not the rule. If it were the rule, um, I think one, we will not be successful as a species or the plant will not be successful as a species. Um, plants defend themselves. They, they know and the pathogens have found ways to go over those defenses and be able to, 
to attack them. So, so it's a it's a it's a fight. It's an evolutionary fight. Let's call it like that. So, the kinds of plants that can attack the pathogens can attack different kinds of plants, but usually the, there's going to be a host specificity. So, single species uh, or certain pathogens will attack one only one genus, and uh, but often and um, well, not often, yeah. Uh, sometimes you find some plants, uh, some pathogens that can actually attack a, a wide variety of plants, and those um, and those are the most difficult to control. But yeah, but in general, uh, we have that specificity between pathogen and, and species. Uh, also, the pathogen uh, the pathogens have. Um, have developed ways to attack certain certain organs in the plants. So not all pathogens will attack everything in the plant. Some are going to be specialists in attacking roots, stems, or leaves. Some will will have have developed ways just to reside inside the xylem, the, the vascular tissues that conduct water inside the plant or in the phloem. And uh, so depending on where the pathogen um, leaves, uh, you're going to have certain symptoms in the plant. Um, others just just basically start attacking the plant, killing the plant, and as they're killing the plant, they're colonizing it. So so those are the, the kind of the, the two different types of, of how plant pathogens attack. Uh, important also the age of the organ, because yeah, sometimes some pathogens will attack at certain times of, of the development of the plant, say, a, a, for example, in pythium a, is very notorious to be a seedling disease. It likes the water a lot and therefore is going to, to be attacking only the seedling stage of, of, of plants, especially in, in greenhouses and, and problems where there is a high humidity going on. So what about pests? Uh, yeah, pests have also developed to, to do the same things as pathogens, but they do it in, in a slightly different way. The end is the same, they, they colonize, they reproduce, they produce more pests. And if there is a suitable host around, hopefully, hopefully for them, they can colonize it and continue living. But in our case, we need to be aware of those those pests. So, um, pests, um, insects, the deer, um, humans can be also pests. Let's call it like that. Uh, we can also be pests. Um, can cause damage in different ways. Uh, in in this case, we're going to kind of focus a little bit on insects because they are the vectors of a lot of diseases and uh, especially viruses and they can they can also and they can produce a lot of damage by both ways one transmitting a disease and two by causing physical damage on the plant so um, insects are really really successful in in earth in the earth have colonized a lot of environments so if you're planting something, most likely you're gonna find a pest or one insect that is going to be causing a little bit of damage on your, on your crops. Uh, identifying the pest is critical to its management. Uh, the injury caused by pests uh, by insects can be distinguished by specific clues left on the foliage. And we're gonna see uh, in the next slides. Um, so we have uh, insects that, that cause damage by sucking. So they have specialized mouth parts that that you that 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 act like hypodermic needles and perforate the 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 dermis of the plant and and get and and get the nutrients out of by, by sucking them out of the plant. When, while they do that, they can transmit viruses, they can transmit um, and, and they cause physical damage 
And so like discoloration of the leaves, causing necrotic spots where they where they feed. Uh, if there is a lot of damage, it can give a wilted appearance, can lead to malformation of leaves, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one case is, uh, yeah, we have the pine needle scale damage in, in this picture. We also have a, a, the chewing mouth parts. So in this case, most of the time is the, the uh, you have the caterpillars, beetles, termites, grasshoppers, crickets, and most wasps that actually do a lot of chewing on the on the plants. And I think I I forgot in here the ants also. You have some ants, especially in in the tropical areas that that actually can, are cutting cutting leaf ants, and and they do a lot of farming with those with those ants uh, with those leaves. Uh, they, they produce a lot of damage, uh, irregular holes in the foliage, missing leaves, uh, what they call window panes, uh, bare veins, wilting, discolored areas of the leaves, severe, severe stems, leaves, buds, and wilting of stems or canes. This is uh, one of the cases. Uh, and the, the third part is uh, rasping you know, and sucking uh, mouth parts. So you see these on on um, on insects that 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 do that action that kind of scrape the surface of the plant tissue and soak up the fluids that ooze out, out of the damaged area. So when some of these um, um, that damage can actually cause a lot of a lot of cosmetic problems in in um, uh, in plants that that are sold for. Uh, for decoration, for example, but also uh, cause a lot of damage in, uh, say, lettuce, tomatoes, uh, all these all these plants that, that perhaps we can we can actually use in for our food. <clears throat> and in this case, is onion trips uh, the damage caused by onion trips in in, in tobacco. So first, a uh, some slides ago, I, I indicated that we need to be aware that a lot of things can happen at the same time. So we need to be aware of symptom variability. There can be more than one problem and more than one pathogen may be involved. Uh, pathogens have varying, varying le levels of virulence and environmental conditions can affect the symptom expression. Um, very important is the host genetics and the physiology can, can affect symptom expression as well. So we have, um, like in, in COVID, uh, I guess, uh, we know not, not everybody that, that sadly died from COVID. Um, okay, let's, let's put it this way. Not everybody that got infected with COVID died from COVID, thank goodness. Um, so there is genetics and physiology in and our own resistance to the pathogen. Uh, the same happens in plants. You have different levels of resistance to different pathogens, and some pathogens have actually evolved in the same areas as the plant that they that that they're attacking. So so there is this evolutionary war that has led to the development of resistance and the development of virulence in the, band, in the pathogen. So, so we need to be aware of all this symptom variability because it's really easy to jump to a conclusion, okay, this is causing the problem. Well, in fact, there might be bacteria and a fungus working at the same time to cause a really, really hard problem on a field. And you're, you're only seeing the fungus, therefore you're thinking, okay, is this, this, is, this is a problem caused only by your fungus. Remember to be true, uh, recording the symptoms, the patterns to, and the progression to help to determine if one or more pathogens are involved. So what is the, what do we do in the, in the clinic usually? Or what do, we, what do I do when I go to the field? I look for patterns of an abnormality. 
I carefully examine the site. I try to find non-uniform or random damage patterns. And because I know those will be restricted to biotic factors. And if I see a damage that is uniform over large areas or multiple species, I, I usually, I, I will believe, I will think it's more of a abiotic factor. In one case, um, in one of the orchards that I visited this year, the grower had applied herbicides to control the, the weeds on the, between the beds. And you can see the damage on the, on the tomatoes. You can see the damage on the beans. You can see a little bit of damage on the, on the peaches, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I guess his screen it wasn't that it wasn't that effective, and you, and it was it was really really clear that there was a herbicide damage on those plants. Um, the next step is we identify the suspects, the symptoms, and the signs. We observe the color, the size, and the thickness of the foliage. We check the stems, the trunk, the branches, and the twigs. We examine the roots on the ground, and we find, if it's possible. Um, sometimes we actually find a fruiting bodies of the fungi, and sometimes we can actually see bacterial uh, ooze uh, on on those on those um, disease uh, plants. And we use uh, diagnostic aids, uh, magnifying glasses. Uh, sometimes, uh, if it's if it's necessary, um, we can actually carry some equipment to the field and 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 carry a little bit of a fast diagnosis in the field. But usually we just uh, bring the samples to the clinic and we run the tests in the clinic. Um, it's really important to ask the right questions for diagnosis. It's really easy to get away and think, and think this, is a, this is what is causing the problem. But if you don't ask the right questions, you might have a, the wrong answer. So if you're asking somebody, or if you're asking a grower, if you're asking your neighborhood, your neighbor, um, the best kind of questions to ask are yes or no questions, because that takes away all the subjective, the subjectivity of the, of the answer. It, um, it gives no space for speculation. You you want to know what happened. You don't want uh, and you don't want to know what uh, in what affected or what not affected. Uh, all those questions are going to come later. But initially, it's best to ask yes or no questions. You want to try to get the full history of the of the issue of the plant. Um, you want to know the damage patterns that are occurring or how they occur, how was the progression. Um, you want to know if there are multiple species being damaged, what are the plants, the parts that are affected, if the damage was gradual, sudden, uh, the age, and, and in case of field, uh, field crops, you want to know what is the percentage, the percentage of the plants that are affected and what is the degree of the injury in those plants. So um, changing a little bit of topics and, and giving you a little bit of uh, enticing you to become um, first detectors, uh, this is one of the problems that, that, that we want to, that we're kind of tracking right now in the, in the country. The spotted lanternfly. Uh, this is uh, this insect um, is really really prolific, as you see in this picture. Uh, they feed on a, on a wide variety of plants: uh, apple trees, stone fruits, grapevines, pine trees. Uh, it's one of the one of those pests that that is right now in the radar of aphids, in the radar of all the, the disease clinics in the country. And it's marching south and west from um, from from uh, the the northern states, uh, um, 
Pennsylvania, uh, Massachusetts, down, down, going, going down south, New York, is is moving is moving south and west. So it's in a radar and it's really really pretty when you see it. It's really small too, um, and they eat uh, they eat the sap from the stems and and cows wounds that that weep. Uh, the excrement is uh, is very nutritious and and creates honeydew and and that honeydew is very sugary and and leads to mold growth and can attract other insects. As you see, this is the adult. Uh, is really really I really like it as an insect. I really like it. It sadly is a <laughs> it's a it's a nauseous pet. Sadly, um, but it's very pretty. So it's really, really easy to identify if you, if you see the, the, the adult. Uh, remember the, the, the size is one, one inch long and half inch wide uh, when adult. These are the different stages, uh, larval stages, sorry, the different larval stages. Uh, so they're getting a little bit uh, different color, colors and, uh, and, and they're changing until until they mature. And these are the egg sacs. Uh, they, you see in the trunks, you see like a, like a waxy gray secretion that covers the, the eggs. And, and that is meant to protect and give the correct environment for the eggs to, 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 to develop and hatch. Uh, usually the cycle is um, they they eggs over winter and they hatch in May and and they they continue developing they continue the cycle. And another problem that we have is right now citrus um, canker. Pedro, yes. can yes, you go sir. back to the last slide? Yep. And and I just wanted to answer some questions that pop up in the chat. Okay. I think uh, uh, that was a question that asked, you know, hey, have we seen spotted lanternfly in Texas? Thankfully, the answer to that is no. But if you were ever up in the northern states, uh, particularly Pennsylvania, uh, especially on the eastern side, you will see them flying around. And um, uh, um, they're quite colorful and real pretty. Uh, the, the reason why that's a big concern is we do know that in, in, in Pennsylvania, where it was first spotted uh, a bunch of years ago, they can do a number on peaches and grapes. And, and those are only two of the many, many crops uh, uh, that this insect can basically feed on and cause damage. So, so the, you know, I've learned my lesson years ago uh, to basically say that, hey, you know, we'll never see them in Texas. Um, I don't say that anymore. I, I think I did that once with Emerald Ash Borer and guess what? Emerald Ash Borer is now in Texas. Um, so spotted lanternfly, unfortunately, um, I believe earlier this year was detected in North Carolina. So it is moving south. Um, it, it, it moves very easily as egg masses. So if you look at the slides right now, you, you, you see that mud cake right on the, uh, uh, um, bark right there, but realize that mud cake could be on a train car, a pallet, um, the back of an RV, um, a trailer. Uh, uh, so keep in mind is 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 those things uh, um, are a concern right now, especially for us in Texas, because uh, namely we do not want this to get out in a. Um, because I think we light our wine a little bit too much and also our peaches. Uh, so the, the uh, excellent. So uh, there was a question to say, where are they originally from? You can actually find fact sheets on those. Uh, I don't think we have one specifically for Texas yet uh, as it is not here, but uh, the uh, USDA has one that's, uh, and NPDN actually has one uh, uh, that's national that gives you a little bit more information about that. And if we can find that, we'll, we'll put the link in the chat. Um, how can they be treated? Uh, the best way to destroy them is to squash them. So I see them on the ground, 
step on them. And I, I know what you're thinking. Some of you might say, whoa, that's so pretty. I hate to kill them. Well, yeah. Um, there are, I, I believe there are certain insecticides that can be used, but again, it's one of those things that in a commercial type setting, um, yeah, um, you can use uh, uh, chemicals, whether it's a fumigant or an insecticide, but keep in mind too, is these things, the eggs that will produce a lot of uh, 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 names uh, and, and those things, they look different, but they look cute. And uh, so, um, uh, uh, and, and there's a lot of them. So it, it makes them very difficult to uh, manage. And no, um, soap solution is not gonna work on this things, uh, this insects. Uh, the, uh, well, I take that back. Soap solution can work if you put enough of it to drown them. Uh, by targeting the abdomen where the aspiracles are, you could potentially um, exphysiate them. But other than that, uh, you know, like utilizing a, a, a soap solution to, to, for example, like to get rid of thrips or something like that, it doesn't work as well uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, this uh, insects. Uh, neem oil and such, we don't have that sort of information. Uh, I don't believe that uh, any studies have been done uh, specifically with that that I'm aware of. Um, uh, basically, uh, I've heard that a lot of this botanical materials does not seem to work uh, very well on the nymph. So these are the uh, youngins before they get flying. So, all right, let's, uh, let's move on to the next thing. Now, uh, keep in mind the next thing, citrus canker, is something that is... Uh, occurring in, in, in Texas. And some of you I noticed are from uh, counties that actually have quarantine zones. So Pedro, uh, back yeah, to you. Yeah. So citrus canker is, is in this case, is a, is, a, is a problem that is caused by a bacterium. It's called Santomonas citrii, Patobar citrii, uh, and causes leaf spotting and, and rind, rind blemishes on the fruit. And um, when conditions are highly favorable, it can cause the defoliation, should die back and the fruit drop. Um, this is more or less what you see these, these pustules and in the, in, the, in the affected tissue usually. Uh, the new lesions uh, usually are raised uh, in, in, in high when you, when you see them uh, from, um, I guess, from a horizontal, point of view and um, on both sides of the leaf and can develop a yellow halo with water soaking margins, which can become corky. Uh, leaves and young green stems are vulnerable for, for infection. This is a problem in citrus trees. Uh, this is a sample that we receive in the, in the, in the clinic. Uh, you can see the, the, the spots, the, the halo, uh, clearly, uh, you can see uh, how how when 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 these uh, when these infection points uh, they grow uh, they can coalesce together and, and make a, a really big area like in this case here. Um, the lesions, more or less, you will start seeing them around seven to ten days of the infection. And the size of the lesion will depend on the type of the citrus that is infected. We talk about a little bit about genetics of the, in the host and genetics in the pathogen. So this, uh, yeah, this is one of those cases that the type of citrus will 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 matter in this case. <clears throat> um, yeah, we already said that the the wounds will become corky and raise margin and, and a sunken center. Uh, really, really characteristic. This this kind of wet. You have the the wetness on the on the edge of the of the of the problem of the of the infection, and that's really really typical because the bacteria is basically breaking the cells, is breaking is breaking all the everything that is going on there. So so is all that is is being being 
let loose and it's causing that all the damage. And that's really, really diagnostic for this pathogen. Uh, situ calculations on stems and the fruit uh, extend to one millimeter deep um, and are similar on the, to the wounds on, on leaves. Uh, and that's, that's also very, very crucial. And, and the fruit, uh, so you, you get a blemish fruit, you, get a, you can get a lot of damage in the plants. So, there is, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem and, and because it's a bacteria, it's transmitted by air, by, by currents and, and sometimes by infected material when you move it inadvertently. It can be a really, really big problem because there's no bactericides in the market that can control it. Um, yeah, in, in pest control, uh, we have fungicides, we have um, means to control fungi, to control Omycis phytophthora epithelums. But there's really, really no bactericides in the, in the market. So, so, so this is why we have quarantine areas in Texas and, and, and what they, what TDA is actually doing is actually going and, and taking down those, those trees. Uh, we, yeah, as we said, we, yeah, we can have premature fruit drop. Um, it causes reduced marketability due to the blemishes. Um, the lesion can pre penetrate deep enough and that exposes the fruit interior to secondary in infection and decay organisms. Uh, and the lesions can remain vi viable for several seasons, um, which, is a, which, is a, which is a problem. Um, in, um, in uh, most of you that have lived in Texas for, for a long, long time remember the the winter storm that we had two years ago. That winter storm actually helped to, to reduce the population of the citrus canker in, the, in South Texas and helped to control a little, a little bit by killing all the hosts. Uh, sadly, yeah, we, we lost a lot of citrus trees in all over the place, but, uh, but that also helped uh, to control the pathogens, sadly. Oh, oh luckily depending how you see it. Sadly, because we lost the trees, luckily, because it helped to control the, the pathogen. Okay, uh, so now talking about the plant disease diagnostic laboratory, Dr. Ong already indicated we have two other labs in Amarillo and in Westlaco. The lab in Westlaco uh, specializes on viruses and, and in Amarillo, um, we have um, a, a clinic uh, that specializes on row crops. And, but here in College Station, uh, we get samples from all over the place. Uh, we get all type of samples, all type of hosts, all type of plants. Uh, and we get uh, soil samples for nematode analysis. We can do some nematode analysis. And we can do, um, that we do not do uh, soil analysis. We do not do nutrient analysis. Um, those can be done by the soil lab and in, uh, in Texas A&M and, and there is also a, a lab that, special, that can actually give you the, the nutrient, uh, a nutrient profile of, of, of your plant if necessary. Uh, in order to, to be really, really helpful uh, and, and proactive when you find a problem in the field, taking quality pictures is ideal. Uh, it will help a lot with the with the with the diagnosis problem. Uh, uh, so you want to make sure that you're trying to capture the essence of the problem, and and so we want to make sure that the image is, has high quality. Uh, and by high quality, uh, is that when you zoom, you can actually see a lot of the details. So you want to make sure that it's in that is in focus you want to make sure that is that you are targeting what you think the problem is that you can give us a little bit of a of the of the whole 
a story of the problem. And we're gonna see uh, some examples now. Uh, ideally, um, you will have a ruler, something of known size. So you can give us a little bit of a, of a, a, a reference to, to the size of the problem. No? In this case, we have um, a lettuce, a lettuce plant that has been damaged by, by botrytis. And you see the, the damage on the leaves in, in all this area. Um, ideally, you can you will send us some transitional foliage. Is, uh, and by transitional, I mean where the plant goes from healthy to sick, uh, because that shows uh, how the pathogen is progressing. It shows what are the symptoms when, when the pathogen is starting to colonize those areas. Uh, ideally, you will, you will also send us a, like a, the surroundings, a little bit of the surroundings, so, so we can have a, 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 good, a, a, a good way to measure how big is the problem. In, in this case, a, you can see how the drought has affected this, this wheat this, um, field. Um, ideally, a, a close-up image of the entire plant in question, a, a close-up of the of the of the problem of the symptoms in the in the plant. Um, ideally, if you see fruiting bodies in fungi in, in fungus uh, fruiting bodies, or abnormalities in the leaf shape or in the flower, yeah, ideally you want to take those pictures. But keep in mind, uh, if you're taking those close-up pictures, also take a um, one of the entire uh, plant part and one of the entire plant, so so we can have the whole range. Um, if we need a, anything else, uh, ideally, and if it's easy, we can we we might ask for more for more pictures if you have more pictures. Um, yeah, we, for identification of a pest, for example, in this case, uh, uh, this is a really, really close up picture of a, of a caterpillar, swallowtail caterpillar. So that was really, really easy to identify. Uh, but sometimes it's gonna be very, diffic very difficult and sometimes we're gonna have to send those pictures to an entomologist. Sadly in the lab, in the, in the clinic, we do not have an entomologist and we are kind of all, all of us are kind of entomologists in, in training and by force, uh, but we are not, not specializing in insects, uh, sadly. Um, in case of grasses, uh, the growth pattern of the problem is, is ideal. And also pictures where, where the leaf meets the stem and when you pull the leaf blade back is, is the best. Um, okay, this uh, this is our lead diagnostician, um, Sheila McBride. Uh, she um, she will try the best uh, to give you an answer for your problem, and uh, with the help of everybody, uh, yeah, she has been helping in the lab for. Um, Doctor, can you remind me, fifteen years more or less in the in the, in the lab. Yeah, so what you're seeing is uh, the Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab in College Station is made up of a, a really small group uh, of, of folks. Uh, Sheila McBride, who you see in this picture, and some of you may have been trained by her, uh, is the head diagnostician. And, and she's been doing, I guess she's been with our department for over 25 years or so, but at, at the clinic for the last, uh, I would say, 16 years or so. Uh, uh, doing diagnostics, highly knowledgeable. You know, one of the things that that when we talk about diagnostics and we try to use it to train students as well is to let them see a lot of different things, which is an opportunity there in itself. Because the more you see the the variety, the diversity, uh, the more experience you have to recognize something in the future. I think the hard part, you know, going back to um, being a first detector is you're going to see things that are on pictures. For example, like the spot length and fly. The good part about that is the uh, images are uh, at least of spot length and fly is uh, the coloration is distinct. 
they look pretty, they look unique. Uh, but when you go to citrus canker, it's a spot on a fruit. Was that spot caused by the bacteria or was it by a bird or was it by some, uh, you know, uh, um, adult running around with a bug assault, you know, one of those salt guns. Uh, so it, it makes it some, some things are easier to recognize as opposed to others. So um, the, the plant disease diagnostic lab is one of those places uh, that does provide a service to be able to help uh, with the diagnosis. Uh, the main goal of a diagnostic clinic, and I do want to point out here very clearly, is we are a confirmatory lab. So, um, and, and, and we are not uh, magicians, soothsayers, or druids, or whatever you want to call it. Um, when we look at something, it takes time. Uh, if we recognize it, you might get an answer in a few minutes. Uh, but often, uh, uh, more often than not, a sample comes in and it will have to go through a um, just as any medical intake process. Whether pictures taken, uh, certain types of tests needs to be ordered for it. Uh, to, uh, the diagnostician or technician needs to figure out what it could be and so they could order the correct tests uh, to try and confirm whether the pathogen uh, is present or not. And if it's an insect, to be able to get to uh, a, a decent identification and as needed, uh, send it off to our colleagues in entomology or utilize our USDA Western Region identifier, which so happened to be located in College Station. And, and, and so one of the things to keep in mind is with diagnostics, it is part science, it is part observation, uh, but there's also a lot of communication. So um, um, the few things that I think Pedro will, will, will would not mention in this slide is the, uh, the plant clinic, um, well, well, we have Sheila that we do have two extension assistants that help provide support. Um, and, and we have several undergraduate students that work as student workers. Uh, so the, the student workers are, are selected uh, it's competitive uh, in, in a sense to be able to get to work there, but uh, we hope that it would give them a, a good uh, sampling and experience uh, and to help them figure out what they want to do uh, when they grow up. Uh, and hopefully that would be in areas of, of plant diagnostics and plant health. Um, <clears throat> the plant disease diagnostic lab is, is part of the uh, extension uh, plant pathology and microbiology. So you will actually have um, fact sheets that are done, uh, folks that actually go out and do training. Um, Pedro Oribe is, is part of the technical science team, but he backs up uh, uh, Sheila at the clinic in terms of providing uh, support and, and sort of the management of, of the clinic itself. Um, <clears throat> uh, we do every plant uh, that is thrown our way as we need them. We try as much not to turn anybody away, uh, but it is a fee-based uh, service uh, that's uh, uh, done at the clinic. Uh, we do provide direct support to our extension personnel. Uh, and, and, and if there's any questions at all or concern, you, know, you can always uh, uh, call us, 979-845-8032. I think the number will be at the last slide. Uh, but much easier is to get on the website and, and see that email and, and email it to us, which is just plantclinic at tamu.edu. Uh, so Pedro, you want to tell them any more about the plant clinic? Yeah, yeah, we have, I think we have a couple more slides. Um, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So how do we submit samples to the, to the clinic? So new clients, uh, there's a new invoicing system. Uh, so, so now everything uh, ideally is electronic. So in order to have a new client in, in the system, um, the person has to fill up uh, this AG257. It's a one-time uh, format uh, that, is, uh, that the client uh, fills up. And it asks uh, for social security numbers and things like that, but it's, uh, 
and sometimes the client, uh, we all know is social security numbers are very private and, and so some people might not want to do it. So if that's your case, uh, sadly, we have to ask you to prepay for the sample. If you fill up the form, the AG257, um, the, uh, we can bill you later and uh, or we will bill you by the time that the, the, that the results are, are submitted. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, we cannot begin any work on the sample until we have this form or the payment in place. Um, that's, 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 yeah, that's uh, our, our directions, basically, <laughs> uh, sadly. Uh, the other form is uh, the plan disease diagnosis form. Uh, so this one has the, your name, has your the grower, the contact for the grower in case that it's somebody else submitting the sample in behalf of this grower. And, 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 and it asks for, for the planting date of the, of the plant, of the problem, uh, the, the variety, the cultivar, the, what is the host, when do you first notice the problem. A, a lot of the same questions that, that I went th through uh, on the slides uh, above. Um, um, how, do, how do you do, um, what product have you applied? Have you applied any pesticides, herbicides, fungicides? Have, what have you done? Um, if, um, if you feel that there's something else that is not on those questions that can help us, yeah, there is some space for those comments. And in the bottom part has, has a, like a section of what do you want to test for? And in, in here is a, there's a list of kind of common problems that we see in Texas. So we have bacterial lethal scorch, we have um, some phytoplasmas, uh, we have um, a rose rosette, we have um, phytophthoras, um, viruses in um, oak wilt, um, cotton root rot, and dwarf, 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 grass, dwarf grass diseases. So uh, some of those have, uh, because of, of the involvement of specific techniques and specific um, kits that we need to, uh, to order, have, an old, have a little bit of a higher price than, than others, but, but usually everything that we get uh, is a $35 uh, diagnostic fee, basically, pretty much everything, and those is, um, those uh, that have um, like viruses or phytophthora, and that we need to run some more specialized tests, have a, a twenty dollar uh, charge, and uh, there is another one uh, that have a little bit more of a higher charge. Um, if any of these tests is not in this form, you can actually write it down and 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 we will try to, to accommodate the request. Um, as Dr. Ron said, when we receive the sample, we do a triage, a triage of the, of the sample. And, and, and after that triage, we might contact you and say, hey, after looking at your sample, we believe uh, this might be happening. We would like to run this test. And, um, but everything will be, will be uh, agreed basically with the with the client. Um, if it's, if you only want the, the the routine diagnostics and all that, and you will be uh, okay with the result, that, that will be fine. But if we indicate, uh, yeah, we feel that there is a virus in this sample, and that might be what is causing the problem, and it might have another um, a little bit of a higher charge. Uh, we will ask you for to do those to do to your permission to run those tests and we will tell you uh, beforehand, obviously. And this is the, the form where you can find it, blendclinic.tmu.edu slash forms slash. And uh, yeah, you can download those, those forms uh, really, really easy. Um, as we said, uh, when, when you're submitted the samples, uh, we, need fresh living symptomatic plant material. That's really, really critical. Uh, when we get uh, dead tissues, we most likely we're gonna be isolating 
Um, not the pathogen, but most likely those other organisms that are saprophytes and that are ju just just taking advantage of the dead of the dead tissues. So so ideally, we need fresh, living, symptomatic material. Uh, if the entire plant is stunting, is stunted, yellowing, or wilting, if it's possible, send the entire plant, including the root the root system. If it's possible, sometimes it's really, really difficult. Uh, we understand. So then, in those cases, try to to get a, a part, a, a representative part of that of that problem. <clears throat> um, a, yeah, we reinforce and and make the effort. Please send symptomatic tissues, uh, twigs, stems with the leaves attached, not just the the, the bare stem, for example. Um, we want to see the progression of the symptoms because when we are trying to isolate in a specific media, those areas where they where the symptoms are progressing, that's, that's most likely where the pathogen is thriving and where the pathogen is alive and and causing the damage. So that's where we focus in, in trying to culture and trying to, to get out. Um, if you suspect uh, there is a root rot issue, well, we need roots. Uh, we need the 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 crown of the of the plant. Uh, really, really, please label clearly the side of each each bag. Um, ideally, with a permanent marker, so if it gets uh, wet or something, uh, we can we can read it. Um, these are really, really specific for oak wilt and Dutch elm disease. Uh, branches that are at least uh, one and a half inches or two inches in diameter with symptomatic leaves. Um, in this process, uh, as you see, we basically, we peel off, uh, we disinfect the whole branch and then we peel off and get to the vascular tissues in the, in the, in the sample. And that's where we culture. So it's really, really important that there is a, that the tissues are alive, that the tissues are symptomatic, uh, ideally. And, uh, and we, yeah, it's really impossible to send dry eyes. Uh, so please do not try to send dry eyes. It will be a mess. Um, so a chest with uh, frozen ice packs is ideal. Uh, ideally also, to ship the samples overnight, so 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 we can. Uh, please do not try to send the Thursday or Friday because most likely it's going to get into into the weekend and it's going to remain in a warehouse for two days. And 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 the sample, if it's wet, it's going to be a total mess, and we're going to just get a soup um, on Monday or something like that in the inside the bag. So try to send the beginning of the week and uh, overnight, and that will be ideal. Um, yeah, please separate the roots in, in a different bag. Separate the soil in a different bag if you're gonna be sending for nematodes. Uh, yeah, separate separate the different parts so so there's no um, so we don't get any uh, roots on the leaves and uh, or or soil in the leaves and things like that, because that, that's gonna create a contamination problems and it's gonna make more difficult the, the, the analysis. Um, yeah, please, if the thorns of spines clearly mark it on the package, so, so, so we are aware. Um, as Dr. Ron said, we receive samples from all over the place and we have permits to receive samples from out of state. So those samples that are from out of state, obviously they, they go into a different, a little bit of a different process, uh, just to guarantee that whatever we get into the clinic doesn't get out of the clinic. So, so we have all those, uh, a lot of um, safeguards in place uh, to, to do the custody of the samples, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're a confirmatory lab, as Dr. Ong said. So we receive samples from, from TDA, we receive samples from APHIS, we receive samples from growers, um, households, uh, yeah, uh, everything. Yeah. All right, and I think this is the last one. Yes, uh, the last one. Um, 
one of the things that I would encourage you guys to do as as you know you you are aware of things and and, and look at things and 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 if you have issues with plants and so on, uh, reach out to your local county extension office. Um, quite often, if it's a common problem, uh, we would hope that they would have had uh, um, or know what's going on and and be able to share that information. Uh, I, I, I like to say, you know, use the clinic as oftentimes as a last resort type situation. Um, often what a county agent would do is if they don't have that answer and if it's a plant disease type uh, related problem or plant health related problem, they may refer you to, to the plant clinic or they may reach out to us uh, uh, to, to get help to get some answers on that part. Um, there are... <clears throat> There are, um, I guess, um, one of the things to, to keep in mind is, uh, uh, you know, we, we covered a whole bunch of different things really at the surface level today. Uh, just to give you a, a, a sampling of, of some of the things that, that you might have to consider if you decide, hey, you know, I, I like to learn more stuff. I like to see more uh, 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 first detector things and so on. Um, expect to go into details on specific things. 